Dearborn makes history with an Eid holiday. U.S. Muslims give $10 to $44 per person in charity before Eid. Dozens mark Al Quds Day in New York City. Israeli police assault Palestinian Christian worshippers. And AI judges in China with robot mediators in Canada. From Toronto Studios, this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Samia Sayed. Our top story tonight, officials in Dearborn, Michigan have announced a shutdown of City Hall offices, public libraries and the 19th District Court on Eid al-Fitr, which falls on Friday. It's the first time in U.S. history that a municipality's offices will be closed in observance of the Islamic holiday. Most of Dearborn's population, which is now over 47% Arab American, is Muslim. Mayor Abdullah Hamoud took office last year as the first Arab American and first Muslim to lead the city. Hamoud has expanded the city's Christmas celebrations, putting up a bigger tree last November. He also launched a series of events for Ramadan amid a debate in the city over how to mark religious festivals. Dearborn and Hamtramck have the highest percentages of Muslim residents in cities in Michigan. Eid is expected to be on April 21st this year. By the end of the month of Ramadan, Muslims are obligated to pay zakat al-fitr. This is a sum of money given to the poor and needy before the Eid al-fitr prayer, which marks the end of the fasting month. The purpose of this donation is to help those in need celebrate and enjoy the Muslim festival. Zakat al-Fitr is a form of charity distinct from zakat, one of the five pillars of Islam. While zakat is calculated based on a person's wealth and is usually paid once a year, zakat al-Fitr is paid per person in a household and is a fixed amount determined by Muslim legal scholars. In the U.S., this charity ranges from a minimum of $10 up to $44. It is required to be paid for each person in the family, including newborns. U.S. Representative Jamal Bowman and Senator Bernie Sanders are urging the Biden administration to revisit billions of dollars in annual military aid to Israel. The letter published on Friday is addressed to President Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Lawmakers are calling for the U.S. to reconsider unconditional aid to Israel in light of the alarming actions of the new extreme right-wing Israeli government in rapidly escalating violence against Palestinians. The U.S. gives over $3 billion annually to Israel, most of which is for military purposes. The letter notes Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's far-right government includes people like Itamir Ben-Gavir, the Jewish supremacist security minister. The group said Ben-Gavir openly encourages and praises violence against Palestinians. The letter has been signed by congressional lawmakers and backed by dozens of advocacy groups. Carrying anti-Israel signs and banners and shouting free, free Palestine and resistance is the only way, dozens of demonstrators marked Al-Quds Day at Times Square in New York City last Friday. Anti-Zionist Orthodox Jews also participated in the demonstration carrying signs and banners that said Judaism condemns the state of Israel and its atrocities. Al-Quds Day, also known as Jerusalem Day, is observed yearly on the last Friday of Ramadan. It was started by Ayatollah Khomeini, founder of the Islamic Republic of Iran in 1979, to express support for the Palestinian people and protest Israel's occupation of Jerusalem. Former U.S. President Donald Trump has vowed to stop what he calls President Joe Biden's war on lawful gun owners. Trump said on Friday that he was proud to be the most pro-gun and pro-Second Amendment president in the White House. He was speaking at the National Rifle Association Conference in Indiana, asking for attendees' support in 2024. I will be your loyal friend and fearless champion once again as the 47th president of the United States, he said. Trump blamed what he called radical left Democrats for trying to use COVID to shut down gun sales during the pandemic. 
He said, I proudly designated gun and ammunition retailers as critical infrastructure. Trump said Biden's gun control agenda is part of the parcel of the left-wing crusade to weaponize government against law-abiding citizens while letting criminals run free. Washington lawmakers are claiming that Jack Tashira, the 21-year-old Air National Guardsman accused of being behind the worst U.S. intelligence leak in a decade, is a criminal. Tashira was arrested Saturday, but he has won praise from the political right. Fox News commentator Tucker Carlson said telling the truth is the only real sin. He added, the media is celebrating the capture of the kid who told Americans what's actually happening in Ukraine. Carlson accused the media of treating Tashira like Osama bin Laden, the late leader of Al-Qaeda. A story on AI judges in China and robot mediators in Canada comes with details after the break. So stay tuned and we will be right back. Welcome back. Artificial intelligence having a say in issues vital for humans may no longer be merely a matter of science fiction. Even in a critical field such as law, it is being used in pilot programs in some places around the world. There is debate whether it is ethical for algorithms that mimic human behavior to have a voice in courtroom decisions. AI is believed to help speed up litigation and automate routine work. It is fielding various pilot applications in different parts of the world, such as China, Estonia, and Malaysia. Robot judges are evaluating small cases in Estonia. There are also robot mediators in Canada, AI judges in China, and AI judicial system in Malaysia. Professor Ahmed Olvi Turkbag, a lecturer at Istanbul Medipol University's law school, told Anadolu Agency there are certain principles regarding the moral control of AI. He said the most important is that AI should be transparent. It must be absolutely controllable. Some experts worry the algorithms are deceptive and pose a risk to privacy and public safety. A far-right Dutch politician and leader of the Pegida Islamophobic group tore apart a copy of the Qur'an Saturday in Amsterdam. Edwin Wagensveld shared footage of his act in front of the Amsterdam municipality on social media. Wagensveld said he was investigated for insulting a group while tearing up the Qur'an. He said tearing apart the Qur'an again is how he can best express his opinion. Wagensveld tore up the Qur'an in front of the temporary Dutch parliament building January 22nd in The Hague while under police protection. He did it again February 13th in Utrecht. Wagensveld demonstration was not prohibited, prompting a counter-protest by the Muslim community. At least 180 people have been killed and hundreds injured in fighting between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary RSF, local medics reported Sunday. Sudan's army said the paramilitary rapid support forces commander Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo fled his hideout. There was conflicting reports about the situation in Sudan amid clashes between the army and RSF fighters in the capital Khartoum. The army chief general Abdel Fattah al-Burhan is considered by some as a criminal and accused the military of carrying out a coup. Security forces killed eight militants in northwestern Pakistan, the army said Saturday. The forces conducted an intelligence-based operation in the area of Zarmilan, South Waziristan district, the army says. There was intense fire exchange between troops and terrorists. Two soldiers were killed. Terror attacks have increased in Pakistan in recent months, especially in the provinces of Khabar Pakhtunkhwa in Balochistan. There has been a surge in attacks since the Taliban's recapture of Afghanistan in 2021. Islamabad has been urging Kabul not to allow militant groups to use its soil to launch attacks on Pakistani security forces. North Waziristan, South Waziristan and the Khabar district, once the heartland of militancy, are among seven former semi-autonomous tribal districts. 
The army has mounted a series of operations in the region since 2014 to eliminate Tehrik -e Taliban Pakistan, an umbrella organization of militant groups. The Arabic press reports violent assaults Saturday evening by Israeli police against Palestinian Christian worshippers in Jerusalem. The worshippers were attempting to make their way to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre for the Saturday of Light commemoration. Police stopped them at the entrance to the church in response to Christians objecting to the barriers police erected to keep crowds away, the report said. Eastern Orthodox priests descend to the church basement where they say their candles are lit from an illumination em emanating from the tomb that once held Christ before his resurrection. The lighted candles are used to light other candles. Typically, 10,000 worshippers flock to the church for this festival. Israeli police have refused to allow more than a fraction of them to gather there this year. The Asia Internet Coalition is voicing concerns over a recent amendment to India's IT rules. The influential industry group represents technology giants such as Facebook, Twitter, Google, Apple and Amazon. It says the changes grant the local government expansive content removal authority without implementing adequate procedural safeguards. India's updated IT rules bar social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter from publishing, sharing or hosting false or misleading information about government business. Under the new regulations, these firms must rely on New Delhi's own fact-checking unit to verify these claims. India is a key overseas market for Facebook, Twitter, and Google. Facebook and Google have poured more than $15 billion in India in the past decade in a race to win the market. Their services now reach more than half a billion users in India. The firms previously pushed back against several of New Delhi's proposals. The coalition recommended that New Delhi to host industry-wide consultations and consider voluntary mechanisms to protect the benefits of the internet and keep people safe from harm. Media freedom in India is rated at 150th level by Reporters Without Borders, lower than Somalia and Colombia. Before I end today's segment, I would like to make a special request. It takes about 55 hours of work per day to produce this news segment for you. It is news that brings a unique perspective, and you can find it only on here, on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision is the not-for-profit organization that produces it. And just like PBS and NPR, we depend on your donations. Please visit muslimnetwork.tv to donate now or click the link below to donate. And that's all from our Toronto studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon for the latest updates. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.